Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Design and Performance Characteristics of Lim M Resp Fourplex Assay. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoot and brought to you by Global Scientific Affairs Molecular Diagnostics at Abbott. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical questions here as well if you have any trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please follow the process to obtain your credits by clicking on the Continuing Education Credits window. I'd like to now welcome our speakers, Dr. Shihai Huang, Senior Director of Assay Development, Molecular Diagnostics at Abbott, and Dr. Gregory Berry, Director, Division of Infectious Disease Diagnostics, Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine, Northwell Health Laboratories. Our speakers will now begin their presentations. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, today, uh, I will present to the audience the design and performance of uh, the Abbott Molecular's first uh, respiratory multiplex assay uh, that we developed on the Alinity M system that detect and differentiate uh, of uh, differentiate SARS-CoV-2, influenza A, B, and RSV. Here's the agenda of the presentation, the three parts. Uh, I will first give a a uh, brief introduction of the respiratory disease state and also the current trend overview. Secondly, um, I will uh, introduce the design of the Alinity M REST fullplex assay. Uh, lastly, uh, I will uh, describe some of the key performance uh, characteristics of this assay. First, uh, disease state and current trend. Uh, as we all know, uh, we are in the, most, in the middle of the most challenging COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, as of January 20th, 2021, the world has seen uh, almost 100 million total number of cumulative confirmed COVID-19 cases. Ever since WHO defined COVID-19 as a world pandemic in March, uh, the, uh, there has been an uh, ever-increasing number of confirmed cases on a weekly basis. For example, since September 2020 to January 2021, the weekly confirmed cases uh, has been more than doubled. During the same time, there has been a lot of activities uh, in introducing uh, molecular diagnostic assay. FDA, uh, as of November 7, 2020, has authorized 189 molecular tests. Uh, for emergency use only in the United States. As we all know, typically, uh, late fall, winter time uh, means the advent of uh, multiple seasonal respiratory viral infections. Among the many EUA molecular tests that have been authorized, uh, there are only very few that detect and differentiate uh, non-SARS-CoV-2 respiratory viruses, such as influenza viruses, and RSV. Today, uh, I will introduce to you our first Abbott Molecular uh, Respiratory Multiplex Assay. But before that, I will first discuss the biology of the virus and also discuss the potential clinical utility of such a multiplex assay. First, SARS-CoV-2. It is a newly identified beta coronavirus in cervical virus subgenera. The incubation time is approximately five days after exposure. Symptoms last for 12 days after onset. Patients with mild to moderate symptoms typically are released from the healthcare 10 days after onset. Those with severe to critical conditions uh, are released 10 to 20 days after symptom onset. Patients who are uh, uh, infected can be infectious before symptom onset. And the SARS-CoV-2, uh, as of January 19, 2021, 
has led to 2 million deaths worldwide and 0.4 million deaths in the United States. The next is influenza virus. Obviously, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is one of the predominant uh, contributors for the, for the seasonal respiratory uh, infection. Influenza virus is an ortho uh, mixovirus. There are two types, two main types that infect humans, A and B. There are many subtypes for flu A and two main lineages for flu B. Worldwide, influenza viruses cause five to three million severe cases every year, between 290,000 to 650,000 deaths each year. In the United States, these viruses lead to 0.4 to 0.7 million hospitalization each year, 24,000 to 62,000 deaths in the 2019 to 2020 season. The duration for uncomplicated illness is one to seven days. This slide shows the seasonal uh, patterns of the influenza A and B infection. This is based on the influenza positive test reported to the CDC by clinical laboratory in the three most recent seasons. As you can see, the timing for the infection by influenza A and B are significantly overlapping, which means that at any given time, there could be co-circulating of both viruses in the same population. Next is respiratory sensation virus, RSV. It is a pyramixovirus, has two subtypes, A and B. Worldwide, it is a leading cause of lower respiratory infection, mobility, and mortality. It causes roughly 34 million acute lower respiratory infections annually in children aged less than five years. It leads to 3.2 million hospital admissions, 60,000 in-hospital deaths in young children. In the United States, RSV is a leading cause of hospitalization for young children less than five years old. The infection of RSV lasts less than five days in healthy adults and roughly seven days in children. Similar to the situation of the co-circulation of flu A and B that was presented earlier, RSV can also co-circulate with other viruses. This is the data based on WHO RSV surveillance program in the United Kingdom. As you can see, again, at a time when there's overlapping infection, there could be both viruses co-circulating in the same population. So this phenomenon begs the question, about whether it is important to detect, as well as differentiate, multiple respiratory viruses. To start to address that question, let's first look at the symptoms. These are the symptoms associated with the three mentioned viral infections. It is clear, even though for some symptoms, they may be predominantly associated with one versus the other viral infection, such as the recent loss of taste or smell is predominantly associated with COVID-19. However, the majority of the symptoms are very similar among the three viral infections. The symptoms may be similar. The clinical features can be quite different between different viral infections. This slide shows the comparison between flu versus COVID-19. For flu, it takes one to four days to show symptoms versus two to 14 days for COVID-19 to show symptoms. Flu is contagious for seven days versus for COVID-19, it's contagious for longer, which is greater than 10 days. Flu causes less severe illness and death. COVID-19 causes more severe illness and death. In addition, there are unique complications associated with COVID-19, including blood clots in veins, arteries, of lung, heart, legs, or brain, and multi-system inflammatory syndrome in children. Similarly, the clinical features can be different between flu versus RSV. Flu starts with a high fever along with aches and pains. 
RSV starts with a cold with fever, leading to coughing, breathing, fast breathing, and wheezing. It takes one to four days to show flu symptoms. However, 46 days to show RSV symptoms. Flu is contagious for seven days. RSV for three to eight days. And it can be much longer for infants or people with weakened immune system. The different clinical features, the treatment for different viral infections can be very different as well. The treatments for SARS-CoV-2, influenza, and RSV are shown on this slide. So this leads to the discussion of the clinical utility of the respiratory multiplex assay. Given the overlapping symptoms, different clinical outcomes, different treatments, it may be very important, therefore, to provide simultaneous detection and differentiation for respiratory viruses, in particular SARS-CoV-2, flu, and RSV, from the same patient specimen. In addition, such multiplex assay will provide results that can inform infectious control measures. And also because this assay targets multiple analytes, this allows laboratories to process more tests in a given period while conserving important testing materials that are in short supply. So next, I will introduce to you the design of the Abbott Molecular Identity M REST fourplex assay. I will discuss the PCR design in terms of the selections of genomic targets. In addition, I will discuss the data reduction and result reporting. This slide shows the basic target uh, design for the, for the assay. This assay provides qualitative detection and differentiation of all these viruses. Flu A, for flu A, the assay targets the matrix gene. It targets the non-structural gene for flu B, the matrix gene for RSV, and the RDRP and N gene for SARS-CoV-2. In addition, an internal control based on a non-competitive design is introduced to the assay because this internal control contains non-relevant plant gene. Therefore, its signal can be used to ensure the performance of reagents and systems. This assay targets highly conserved sequences for each of the targeted analytes. This table summarizes the large body of bioinformatical evidence based on the sequence alignment of tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of sequences from the publicly available sequences from the databases. And this analysis confirmed the confidence of this target design. But specifically for SARS-CoV-2 detection, this assay detects two targets, as mentioned before. One is RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, the other is NG. Each of the two target regions is highly conserved. The employment of such a dual target design allows for redundancy in the case of very rare viral mutations. The importance of the selection of conserved target region is highlighted by the recent uprising of the highly vir virulent SARS-CoV-2 variant from various geographic regions in the world. Our bioinformatical analysis confirmed that the Abbott primary probes designed for the SARS-CoV-2 assay are not impacted by this variants that come from, for example, United Kingdom, South Africa, and Brazil. I will move on to the data reduction and software. The signal that is detected for those target analytes are processed through this multi-layered comprehensive system that involve signal processing, the evaluation of PCR reactivity, and determination of the validity of the PCR curve, all of which lead to the report of the reliable assay results. Max ratio technology, it is a proprietary algorithm that is the key feature that supports the data reduction strategy. This 
maturation technology transform the PCR curve into well-defined peaks, many aspects of this ratio peak reflect the efficiency of the PCR reaction and therefore are used to determine the validity of the PCR curves. This is one of the, again, the key features that ensures the reliability of the result from Abbott identity assay. The identity M system reports clear-cut, straightforward result interpretation for the specimen that are tested. For each specimen, the selected biomarker that was selected at the time of sample ordering will be, will be given uh, with a, a result as well as interpretation. So this assay is developed on uh, Abel Malikler's new Alinity M in instrument that were introduced to the U.S. market at the early part of 2020. And this instrument provides random access to multiple assays on board the system. It provides the user the ability to have continuous access to samples and reagents. And the instrument uh, provides very fast turnaround time. In fact, it's market leading compared to uh, other major large uh, molecular systems. Alinity M can process 300 samples per each eight hours. Customer can load up to 20 assays on board the system. For uh, urgent sample ordering, Alinity M provides the SAS prioritization capability. For the last part of the presentation, I will describe to you some of the key performance characteristics of this assay. This slide shows the limit of detection performance of uh, common strains for SARS-CoV-2, as well as two strains each for influenza A and B and RSV, including RSV A and B. Obviously, the analytical sensitivity determination in PCID for each strain, viral strain depends on the specific strain and the specific lot that are tested in the study. This slide shows the inclusivity performance of the assay. In this study, a total of 33 virus strains are analyzed were tested, including six isolates of SARS-CoV-2, 15 strains of flu A, including H1N1, H3N2, H5N1, H7N2, seven strains of flu B virus, including both of the major lineages, Victoria and Yamagata, and five strains of RSV, including RSV A and B. The assay is able to detect extremely low target level for each of the tested inclusivity strains and isolates. In the analytical specificity study, a total of 55 potential cross-reactants were tested, including 31 viruses, 21 bacteria, two fungi, and a put human nasal wash. No cross-reactivity was observed in the presence of any of these potential cross-reactants. This slide showed the shows the precision performance of the assay. A total of nine panel members consisting of uh, two target level of each of the four analytes, SARS-CoV-2, flu A, flu B, RSV, as well as a negative panel member. Among the up to 30 replicates tested across five days, 100% agreement was observed compared to the expected result. And also excellent uh, precision was demonstrated by evaluating the SD and percent CV of the PCR cycle number. The clinical performance of this assay was evaluated by testing over 100 nasal pharyngeal swab specimens collected in viral transfer media. When compared to the respective comparator, this assay achieved 100% positive uh, percent agreement and 100% or near 100% negative percent agreement. So excellent clinical performance demonstrated in this study. 
This slide summarizes the assay design and performance attributes as well as the workflow attributes. The assay is compatible with multiple upper respiratory specimen types. It consists of a negative control and positive control. The assay is highly sensitive for each of targeted viral analytes. It includes a non-competitive internal control. It report qualitative assay results, give 100% specificity, and for clinical performance, 100% PPA or 100% or near 100% NPA. For the workflow, in terms of control, the customers only need to run one control set consisting of negative and positive control once every 24 hours. The sample volume uh, is relatively small. The extraction method is the same as multiple other alinity M assays, including the single-plex alinity M SARS-CoV-2 assay. Less than two hours of turnaround time. 300 results per each eight hours. When the system is operated continuously in a 24-hour period, more than 1,000 results can be reported. This system allows the stat function that is helpful to process urgent uh, uh, ordering. The assay has the liquid uh, reagent format, which is stable for up to four days on board the instrument. In summary, the Alinity REST fourplex assay is designed based on a solid scientific foundation. And this assay provides clear and clinically relevant results to customers. The assay and the system enables efficient laboratory workflow in a time of high demand. This assay is an additional tool that can be used in laboratory testing, clinical management, and public health efforts. So this indicates the end of the presentation. I'll, I would like to thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Wong, for that great introduction. And I'm really happy to be here today to discuss this topic with you. So today we're gonna to be discussing the performance of the Alinity M REST4 Flex EUA assay. And so here are my disclosures. Uh, I am, you know, the support for this program is provided by Abbott, and also I'm speaking on request of Abbott. And so the objectives of today's talk are going to be to discuss current respiratory and SARS-CoV-2 data from New York, and also then to review our data and workflow characteristics of the platforms being used for respiratory and SARS-CoV-2 testing in our laboratory. And so just to start with a basic introduction, of course, of SARS-CoV-2. So as, as we all already know, I'm sure, but it always is good to go over. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. This was first discovered in December of 2019 in Wuhan in the Hubei province of China. The genus is beta coronavirus and subgenus Cervecovirus. The clinical disease is referred to as COVID-19, which is obviously the term that we use most of the time when we discuss the virus because we're discussing a lot of the, the clinical issues associated with viral infection. And there have been over 500,000 deaths in the United States so far with 50, almost 50,000 deaths alone in New York State. And so this virus has, has had an enormous toll over the last year plus on our, uh, on our country, on our economy, and obviously on our health. And the first confirmed cases in New York were at the beginning of March in 2020. And it very quickly became apparent to everybody that cases were more widespread than, uh, than we had initially hoped for. And here you can see just a little diagram here on the right-hand side of the screen, just looking at the various pieces of the virus that are targeted by diagnostic assays. I mean, here you see the nuclear capsid, you can see the spiked glycoprotein, which you hear a lot about, and the S-gene, of course, encodes for that. You see the envelope small membrane protein, which is the E, you see the membrane protein, which is M. So these are all pieces that you hear as, as uh, these viruses get discussed. And of course, 
This is not the first coronavirus to be around. Every year you have four seasonal coronaviruses that tend to circulate. And these coronaviruses are the ones that cause, which would be called like almost like the common colds. And that's NL63, 229E, HKU1, and OC43. And when we look at viral infections during what used to be a typical respiratory season, out of our 100% that were positive, if we looked at that as the whole pie of just positive results, we would see that these uh, combined would cause about 10% of our respiratory infections. So coronaviruses have been around, and this is obviously this, the new coronavirus, which is why initially it was called, called the novel coronavirus. And so when we look at the types of testing for SARS-CoV-2, you can really think about it as three big buckets. One is molecular, which is the one we talk about a lot. The second one is viral antigen, which can be done more like in a point of care kind of environment, but also can be done on large analyzers now as time has gone on. And also serology or antibody testing, which basically looks at the host immune response. So almost all of the testing you can think of will fit into these three buckets. It's really kind of important to understand how they fit in and where each test kind of falls. So this was actually a really nice article in JAMA discussing the various types, and this was actually published pretty early on in the pandemic. And as you can see, uh, you have basically laid out from left to right, you have before symptom onset and after symptom onset. And of course, before symptom onset, especially early on in the pandemic, before people were doing asymptomatic testing and screening and all these other uh, types of uh, you know, testing, I mean, really, the symptomatic patients were getting tested. So before symptom onset, detection was unlikely. Now, the reason I point that out is because not because the PCR would have been negative, because you can see that blue line there, which is the PCR line, and you basically see... Uh, the various sources, right, in the PCR for either nasopharyngeal, or you see a BAL or a sputum in the pink line, and then you even see viral isolation from the respiratory tract, which would indeed be positive before symptom onset, typically, but detection was unlikely because testing was unlikely. Now, as time goes on and symptoms, uh, you know, start to occur and then testing occurs, well, PCR is likely for the first few weeks of infection that PCR will still be likely. In fact, PCR out in week four, five, and six, while it says here that PCR is likely negative, you know, we've come to find out there, there are patients that are, that have uh, positive PCR results sometimes out over two months. And so while it's unlikely that PCR would be positive, it's definitely not, um, it's not uncommon. But antibody detection is thought to be after the first few weeks of infection, really the, uh, what will, will end up being the test that won't be diagnostic, will, but will be the test to indicate that you were infected. And you see the dotted lines, both the purple being the IgM and the green being the IgG. You can see them coming up, you know, at the end of week one, and then they basically spike. And then what happens is the IgG stays persistent and the IgM will wane over time, but they both come up at virtually the same time. Uh, the molecular tests and, and of course the rapid antigen tests when they're used are thought to be diagnostic whereas I said the, uh, the antibody tests are thought more to be for epidemiologic purposes and to understand immunity. And so when we look at diagnostic testing in New York City, I just wanted to show this to kind of give you an idea of the lay of the land as far as molecular diagnostic testing versus using rapid antigen tests. And you can see that consistently molecular tests have been used. I mean, this is a data pull just from January to early March. And you can see that drop off at the end in gray. That's just because basically those days were incomplete data because the data hadn't been collated yet. But if you look, you see this consistent around 60,000 tests a day that spike through the week and then drop on the weekend. But you see this consistent 60,000 line. And you see that while rapid antigens um, you know, while there are rapid antigens being done, they've kind of has stayed at a, at a steady state that is lower than the PCR rate. So, you, you know, there's still a lot of our molecular rate. So there's still a lot of molecular testing being done. I think one interesting topic that people have been thinking about that I've definitely been thinking about as you go forward, are we going to start to see a seasonality for SARS-CoV-2? And so the reason is, is because, you know, we see a seasonality for these four coronaviruses that are already circulating. And this was actually from the Swiss Med Weekly back in early 2020, uh, looking at 
seasonality and trying to make the comparison. So this was basically looking at uh, coronaviruses, not SARS-CoV-2 in Stockholm, Sweden, between 2010 and 2019. And it's really interesting to watch that aggregate data and watch as it works across months, you can see these peaks that, that, that tend to happen at around this immunity falling at around this 40 week interval. So it's really kind of interesting uh, when we specifically look at, at some of the coronaviruses and this, this cadence of what it is to be immune and then lose immunity. And you tend to see the seasonality that falls in place. Which is, uh, I'm, which is always on people's mind about what's going to happen with, with now with SARS-CoV-2 as far as immunity goes. And you can basically see in panel A, you just see that spike. You see that spike, that yearly spike. And then in panel B, you see basically that weaning over the summertime and then that re-emergence as the fall comes in. I think that conversation about if this is going to happen and we're going to get a seasonality like we do with the other coronaviruses, then what other viruses are we going to need to test concurrently, which will be circulating at the same time? And so when we look at testing guidance for clinicians during what would be what was traditionally the flu season, now incorporating SARS-CoV-2 into this, uh, this scenario, so you get a circulation of flu, RSV, and SARS-CoV-2 all at the same time. So what are the recommendations, right? So this is for the outpatient clinic or emergency room uh, patients that, do, that have acute respiratory illness and come in, whether or not they have a fever. And so basically, you have two questions. Does the patient need to be admitted? Okay, let's say yes, the patient does need to be admitted. Well, you're going to want to do SARS-CoV-2 and at least influenza testing, right? So that patient's going to need both because obviously they could have flu or they could have SARS-CoV-2, especially moving forward into the next season. While we've seen very, very low rates of flu this year, I think that this was an exceptionally, uh, an exceptionally interesting year as far as flu spread because of masking and because of social distancing. So as this falls into a seasonality, it's quite clear to me and to others that, that you know, other respiratory viruses are obviously going to be in the mix and will also need to be tested for, particularly flu and RSV. And so the patient needs to be hospitalized. It's pretty obvious they need flu testing. If they don't need to be hospitalized, uh, SARS-CoV-2 testing could potentially be right now the, uh, the, the path that they could go down. Also, though, influenza testing is, is not a bad idea. And you could see here in the second point where it talks about influenza testing and treatment. But I mean, this just obviously has an impact on how we're going to, uh, how we're going to test moving into the future. And so when we talk about respiratory testing, including SARS-CoV-2 uh, and molecular specifically here at Northwell, uh, I'll just give you a background first on our health system and then discuss what we do as far as testing. So Northwell Health is actually a large health system in Long Island and also in New York City and up into the Westchester region. Uh, we're predominantly in Long Island, but we have other sites, as you can see, in Manhattan and also in Westchester. And we have uh, you know, several affiliated hospitals. We're up over 20 hospitals now. And a lot of this hospital work is either done on site uh, for, for respiratory SARS-CoV-2 or it comes into the, the core labs. And it's really a mix and medley of both, depending on on how, uh, depending on what the needs of, of specific hospitals are, and the outpatient work mostly, almost all of that comes into the, into the overall core labs if molecular testing is needed. And so when we talk about the models of testing, typically what we're doing here is centralized testing. We're either doing it at a core central lab, or we're doing it in this top panel right at a satellite lab, which would be a satellite lab at the hospitals. We refer to these as rapid response labs. Those are basically our, our hospital-based labs where our rapid and stat testing needs to be done and respiratory testing falls into that bucket, uh, especially because of, of patient cohorting and the need to have that answer quickly. Right? We also have um, professional point of care that gets done at doctor's offices, specifically at clinics by medical staff, and they gets tested on site. So that is also uh, a proportion of our work. But I mean, mostly what I'm talking about today is the, either the core lab or the satellite labs, and specifically the core labs in this case. And so when I talk about COVID-19 diagnostic testing at Northwell, I really was thinking about it 
initially as a sprint that turned into a marathon. And it's a marathon that continues uh, to this day, really. So pre-COVID-19, even last flu season, we were really running three different tests. We were running Genmark respiratory panels in the health system uh, for, for the larger um, you know, viral panels. For Luminex, we were running flu A, B, and RSV, and for Cepheid at the core lab, and then at Cepheid at the hospitals for flu A, B, and RSV. So it was, you know, we actually had, I think, a little bit more diversity than most uh, for as far as our respiratory testing, but I mean, it really was not that much. When we go and we look now at the situation from March 2020 onward, um, from there, we needed to, to very rapidly get COVID-19 diagnostic testing up and running. Um, we started with the modified CDC assay on, on the, actually on a Sunday night which was March 8th uh, of 2020, March 8th of last year. We very recently watched the anniversary of that testing uh, go by and just reflected on how um, how insane of a year it really had been as far as standing up testing and continuing to test. Uh, we Shortly thereafter, we went live with the Genmark, which allowed us to go from about 100 a day up to hundreds of tests a day. Then we went live with the Panther Fusion, which, which put us on more of the industrial scale of thousands of tests a day. We brought in the Diasorin as more of a stat test where we could do quick uh, testing that didn't require the larger platforms. And then it was very obvious to us, we also had to roll out testing to the hospitals, right? So at the hospitals, we ran in the, everything from a Cepheid to an ID Now to a Genmark to an Abbott M2000 and even a, a small platform called Biomeme at the hospitals for a little while just to keep testing up and running. And then we even uh, brought in Panther Fusions into the core lab. I mean, Panther Aptima actually on, on TMA into the core lab, which brought us up to the 5,000 a day range. And as we talk about the core lab, um, we then brought on, besides putting Panthers at, at six of our hospitals, we also brought in the, Pan the, uh, the Abbott Alinities at the actual core laboratories, which we brought in one Abbott Alinity and then we brought in two more Abbott Alinities. And we also have a Roche 8800, just trying to build capacity through that June, July, August, September timeframe. And I wrote here, we were still building capacity October through December. What I meant to say is October through present, because even right now, we're still having conversations about building capacity, although we're starting to kind of see where um, we we have built enough capacity to handle the health system and we've, di uh, we've diversified enough. So any increase we may see, as long as it's uh, not uh, completely disproportionate. And so when we talk about the large respiratory platforms that we have uh, for SARS-CoV-2 testing, we, were, we really have the Abbott, uh, we have the Abbott Alinity, we have the Panther system and the Panther Fusion actually. And so basically if you look at that system, the Panther Fusion is just the piece that's on the left. If you took that off, then you would have a Panther and the Cobos 8800. And so these are really three large uh, large platforms for, for high volume testing. Both the Alinity and the Fusion can do about 1,000 samples a day. The Cobos 8800 can do about 3,200 samples in a day. And you can see the various times to result on these platforms. But these are all large, large platforms for large high volume testing. And so what we really wanted to do was when we brought the Alinities in, we wanted to see how they would compete with our other assays that do flu A, B, and RSV testing. Because we were doing SARS-CoV-2 on all three of these platforms. Now we wanted to bring in the next, um, the next generation of testing with Abbott and really check out how the Alinity M was going to perform with their fourplex. And so their fourplex was actually, their fourplex is actually a flu A, B, RSV COVID. And so here's just a disclosure about EUA, about emergency use authorization, that just basically states that this product has not been FDA cleared or approved, but it's been authorized via the EUA pathway, and it's for detection of SARS-CoV-2, flu A, flu B, and RSV. And you know, basically the, uh, the, the legal implications of what EUA means uh, right down here on the bottom. And so what we did in this case was we actually evaluated the Alinity M fourplex and we compared that to the Cepheid fourplex, which we previously had and had been using, and the uh, and also the Cobos uh, SARS-CoV-2 flu A and B. And, and of course, you know, the, the Expert Express is made by Cepheid and that's the Gene Ex Expert Express. And the, uh, the Cobos 
uh, is made by Roche and is the system is the co-boss Liat. And so what we did is select uh, both SARS-CoV-2 positive specimens and flu AB RSV positive specimens uh, using various clinical platforms that we already were doing patient testing on. So we used Aptima basically to collect all of our SARS-CoV-2 positive specimens. And then we used either the Aries or the Genmark Eplex, the Luminex Aries or the Genmark Eplex to collect flu AB RSV specimens. And then we tested them on the Alinity M, on the, on the Expert Express, and on the Cobos SARS-CoV-2 to do a head-to-head -head, head comparison. And what we found when we looked at the Alinity uh, agreement, when we compared it to the Cepheid in both the Liot, so I'll go with the short names, the Cepheid and the Liot, um, we basically found that they all had a very high degree of, of positive percent agreement, 100% uh, negative percent agreement across the board for all analytes. And basically the only difference that you see at 95% positive agreement was the Cepheid for RSV versus the Alinity. And you basically look at the Cepheid SARS-CoV-2 versus the Alinity. And so a very high degree of, of, uh, of comparability between the platform. One thing I want to point out is you see that Cepheid RSV is, is the only RSV comparator to Alinity. That's because the Liat does not have RSV. It only has flu, flu A, B, and SARS-CoV-2. So that's an important difference just to point out if you were wondering. In addition, what we did was an LOD study. So it was important for us to actually look at the limit of detection to try to understand the sensitivity of these platforms. And, uh, and what we used was actually a Seracure panel for both SARS-CoV-2 and RSV. And then we used Zeptometrics for flu A, B as reference material. And what we found was that if we look at where the cutoffs were for the LODs and the number of replicates you see, we did between five and 10 replicates at each concentration. Uh, you saw that the respiratory fourplex for the uh, for the alinity actually continued down to 12.5 copies per ml. So just above that is basically where you start to see less than 100% agreement. When we looked at the LIA, we basically saw that at 100 copies, we started to lose flu A and then SARS-CoV-2 is the most sensitive at 25 copies we, we lost, uh, we were less than 100%. When you look at the Cepheid, um, the Cepheid product, you basically see that RSV is good to about 200 copies per ml, SARS-CoV-2 is good to about 50 copies per ml, and then you see flu A, one of the flu A targets and the flu B target good to 12, about 12.5, right above 12.5. So overall, a uh, very good performance from, from all three systems. I mean, if you look at these copy numbers, this is quite good. And the Alinity, I think not surprising knowing that it's a large, it's a large platform with a larger, uh, you know, extraction volume, et cetera, and also a longer cycling time actually is the most sensitive of these three. And furthermore, um, this was actually a study done with externally sourced remnant specimens, uh, and this was actually done at Abbott, looking at respiratory fourplex EUA assay agreement uh, between methods that were already 510K cleared. So these are FDA approved assays for flu and RSV. So they could understand basically how their product was, compete, was competing with what was already on the market. So, you know, the Hologic Panther Fusion flu AB RSV was already on the market the previous year and is FDA approved. And the Genmark Eplex respiratory pathogen panel was the panel that was the respiratory panel previously. So you see that we, there were, they had 52 flu A's swine flus or seasonal H3s, 47 flu Bs, and 51 RSVs, both RSV A and B, positive specimens. And you could see that there was a very high level of agreement between all three of the targets, between 98 and 100%. So the assay performed very well when comparing to already FDA-approved tests. And so in conclusion, really, the comparator respiratory assays all performed similarly. Uh, with a PPA greater than or equal to 95% and an NPA of 100%, which is great. The comparator assays were a little bit less sensitive than the alinity when you looked at the, the overall LOD studies. There was a high degree of agreement uh, with observed uh, comparison between two FDA approved assays when flu and RSV, which were the obviously the previous products were checked. And comparator platforms in this study had uh, lower testing volume capability compared to the alinity system. 
you know, we're talking about systems that are, are more um, sample to answer systems that are that could be done in smaller labs versus a larger volume that could be done like 120 specimens loaded at once in the alinity. But their patient care uh, utility may be very different. You know, a LIOT or a CEPHI is going to potentially go in a different uh, type of laboratory, a smaller volume laboratory than than a Linity M. Not in all cases, but in some cases. So it's just it all comes down to kind of where, what your patient population is, what your numbers are for testing, and then uh, also what your turnaround times are for testing. And this all needs to be considered, and it is all very important. But I think most important from this study was basic performance characteristics, which uh, which were quite good. And really, when we look at a path forward for respiratory testing, uh, you know, I think respiratory testing is SARS-CoV-2 testing now built in, right? And so we're going to need to continue to build d diversification for, for respiratory testing in general, including SARS-CoV-2. I think there's going to be continued evaluation of testing performance to understand um, which test to use and which tests are performing well. And also, as we start to see more variants in situations like this, it's obviously going to be very important to watch uh, testing performance moving forward by both in clinical labs where it's likely to get identified up front, and then also to feed this information back to manufacturers and, and the FDA so everybody's aware of, of what the real-time data is. I think performance characteristics along with supply chain realities will both need to be considered when choosing platforms. And vaccination, obviously, is going to hopefully impact testing demand in the upcoming several months. And uh, we're very hopeful about that, especially uh, looking at the performance of the vaccines thus far. And so with that, I would like to just thank the Northwell Health Department of Pathology and Lab Medicine and my colleagues there, Dr. Wei Zen, Betsy Smith, and Rahana Manji, and all the awesome members of, of my molecular team who do the clinical testing. And I'd also like to thank Abbott and Dr. Daniela Luchik for her uh, for her generous support of this study and also for helping us out with all of these new products. And I really appreciate that. So with that, I'll take any questions. And I just uh, thank you for your time. And we've put together some frequently asked questions we would like to discuss. Our first question, Dr. Wong, what is the difference in SARS-CoV-2 limit of detection between the alinity M SARS-CoV-2 singleplex assay and the RESP fourplex assay? And why are there different units of measurement? Uh, that's a good question. So the many of the design principles are really uh, very much the same between the alinity and single plex assays and the four plex assays. So that's reflected to uh, the performance attributes, in particular for limited detection. Both assays report limited detection in TCID as well as either copy or genomic, genome equivalent. The copy and genome equivalent are really equivalent kind of unit of measure. And as reflected in the product labeling, the claim for the limited detection are really quite similar between the two assays, essentially the same. Thank you very much, sir. And with the Alinity M RESP fourplex assay, do I need to report all four markers when I run the test? That's another good question. The Alinity M software uh, allows the multiplex assay Enable, so they enable the customer at the time of ordering the result of the sample processing to select uh, different combinations, either single or different combinations of bar markers at the time of ordering. For this particular multiplex assay, this is the uh, uh, the fourplex assay uh, for EUA. Uh, when customer order this EUA assay, the SARS-CoV-2 needs always to be selected. But besides SARS-CoV-2, the other three viruses can be selected in any combination. Thank you. And will the fourplex assay be available on the M2000? So uh, our molecular developed this fourplex assay with a mind to uh, support a customer uh, in the midst of the pandemic where there's a high demand of uh, 
acid reagents and the laboratory throughput. The combination of the multiplex uh, aspect as well as the operational efficiency offered by the Alinity M system is an ideal uh, co combination to enable the customer to achieve their goal. Obviously, the uh, instrument uh, features one 2000 is different. And uh, at this point, the four-factor assay uh, is not uh, available on M2000. But uh, when uh, a uh, time comes in the future when that need become obvious, uh, that certainly will be considered as well. Thank you very much. And moving on, Dr. Wong, can I run both single SARS-CoV-2 assay and the rest fourplex assay at the same time on the Alinity M? So, so this uh, question really is related to one of the key features that Alinity M system offers, which is the, what we call random access. What that means is that when we have multiple assays loaded on the system waiting to be used, the, uh, for any incoming sample, right, uh, any of the loaded assay can be selected uh, where applicable uh, as needed for the incoming specimen. So uh, it could be uh, assay one with a sample one and assay two with a sample two. So the answer is yes. So uh, uh, single plex COVID uh, uh, SARS CoV 2 assay versus a full plex uh, assay is. And they're not uh, special in this manner at all. As all the other assays for analytic system, uh, this assay can be run together. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. And our next question is, what is the time to first result and throughput for the fourplex assay? Does it take longer than the Alinity M assays? So maybe I, uh, to address this question, um, uh, I can uh, kind of continue on my answer to the last question because that's related. Uh, the, the workflow under the hood of the system uh, is such that that enables the random access actually rely on uh, the process uh, basically uh, lead to the same, uh, 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 same uh, turnaround time for all the assays. Right? So uh, as I mentioned in my slides, the turnaround time for full plus assay is less than two hours, 115 minutes, 115 minutes. And that really is the same uh, among all the assays on Olympic M systems. Thank you so much. And our final question, what monitoring steps are in place to ensure the four plex assay as well as single plex assays will continue to detect future variants of the SARS-CoV-2? Uh, that's a, a very good and relevant question. And um, obviously, we have seen uh, the uh, increasing uh, variants of SARS-CoV-2 that's been reported. And we are, uh, at Abbott, keeping a close look uh, at the situation. Uh, we are doing a regular sequence analysis based on the database that I mentioned in the slide. In addition, Abbott has this global surveillance program uh, that is monitoring, constantly monitoring the performance of the new strain by doing not only the bioinformatic work, but also actively procuring specimens uh, that potentially contains uh, the uh, polymorphisms uh, and to be able to analyze directly the impact on the assay performance. Dr. Wong, thank you so much for your presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing comments before we go? Uh, sure. Thanks for the opportunity to present uh, to the customers uh, uh, and introduce to them this very exciting uh, multiplex respiratory assays from Abbott Molecular. Uh, we believe this uh, assay performance combined with the performance of the system can offer customers something that uh, tangibly uh, better than what they're facing, what they're using today. And uh, I have to say also that as a uh, asset developer, as part of the bigger abomolecular R&D team, uh, we have been uh, working very hard and there are many dedicated hardworking colleagues 
and we are very honored uh, to uh, be part of the effort to introduce such an important product uh, that we hope uh, can be effective too uh, in the fight uh, against the COVID-19 challenge. Thank you, Dr. Huang and Dr. Barry for your informative presentation. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Global Scientific Affairs Molecular Diagnostics at Abbott for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye.